We are now recording. Excellent. Let me share my screen. That is not the screen I wanted to share. Pause one second. Pardon me one second, team. I'm going to get this uh, screen pulled up of our 800 manual. So pardon me for just one second. I've only done this 20 times before. I apologize, teams. Give me one second. So, so sorry. Excellent. This is just what I wanted to deal with today. Perfect. All right, teams. Worst case scenario, I'm going to go through the book. Hopefully you have your manual uh, in front of you or you have it saved on your computer. Uh, I apologize about my technical difficulties. Uh, sometimes when I set things up, they do not run exactly the way I want them to. But we're going to get there. Okay, I'm having technical difficulties, guys. And instead of spending the next hour trying to figure this out, I am going to roll through. I am terribly, terribly sorry about that. So I'm gonna stop share, but I am using my 800 manual. Uh, hopefully all of you have that available to you. I greatly apologize. It's just not gonna be able to be on the screen right now, but I'm still going to have some notes for you. And I'm going to be referencing, I know this is backward, but the best practices, uh, best practice guide uh, for cheese makers. A lot of this material that we're about to cover is also duplicated in that, uh, in that book. And I'm gonna reference which chapter to go to. So again, sorry about the screen. You're just gonna have to look at my lovely face for about an hour as we go through here. But welcome. Um, again, so sorry about the, the technical difficulties. Uh, the goal for the day is we've gone through in the 800, the IDF 800 manual, uh, we've gone through everything up to 805. I'm going to be able to push through and cover most of the material from 805 through to the end, and I'm going to cover it today. And like I said, uh, it may last a little bit more than an hour because I want to cover it. But again, this is recording, so I'm going to continue. I am going to post this uh, to the IDF YouTube page. So if you have to leave early, just excuse yourself and uh, come back whenever you can basically. All right. So with uh, starting at page 148 is going to be page 148 in our 800 manual. I've got my hard copy here uh, because I knew technical difficulties would abound one of these days. All right. And if you have any questions, please shoot them out, uh, hit the chat or use it uh, or speak out in person. But here, this, uh, this chapter is covering uh, moving cheese out the door, so marketing and merchandising. 
For best practices with cheese makers, see chapter seven. Chapter seven of the best practices guide for cheese maker also covers this material and it goes deeper into, uh, into the information. And I'm gonna be covering the best practice guide for cheese makers in, in our next calls coming up. So we'll, get to, we'll be able to go through that project as well too. All right, so the thing to consider in this uh, chapter is really to focus on what ways can sell more cheese in your shop? You will be asked questions about this. Uh, this, this chapter here in IDF really focuses on shop sales, but you're gonna get asked questions anywhere from selling from being a, a, a producer, selling to a distributor and a distributor, selling to a retailer, all the way from a retailer selling directly to the consumer. So you're gonna be responsible for knowing that entire chain moving down. And a lot of this, if you work in shops, you're gonna be able to get this kind of good. Uh, but public relations uh, on that page, page 148, I highlighted as a good thing to know. And promotional education in store tastings. A lot of this stuff in this chapter, I'm going to breeze through because it can, it can be uh, not necessarily nebulous, but you can have different opinions on this. And we want to be able to focus on facts as far as ways to generate more power for your business, or more, more business, basically. And things that they will ask on the test or, you know, throw out some suggestions. What are ways? to increase business in your shop. And it could be, and then tie it into this information here. So in-store tastings, classes, um, I would highlight that, you know, class programs. Um, and then also they will, I remember being asked questions about uh, looking at page 149, optimizing online and social media presence. That is something that's really kind of taken up, especially since this test got implemented, social media has definitely grown, but that's a big part of it, social networking. Um, you're probably not gonna get asked specific questions about Facebook or Twitters or Foursquare. I wouldn't imagine you're gonna get specifically with that. So don't, don't bog yourself down into that, but just know what kind of social media platforms are out there. One not listed here, which had a big impact on Feta sales last year, TikTok. You know, so just thinking of that, that's just how to conceptualize thinking, okay, how can social media impact cheese sales greatly, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, now moving forward to, so you'll probably get asked maybe one to two questions about that kind of stuff. So we're just moving forward with that. Continuing on 149, understanding labeling requirements. So there's a lot of information that goes into to labeling. I'm also gonna refer you back to chapter uh, seven. Uh, the the uh, guide best practices for cheesemakers is going to cover this material a lot more detailed than this book right here. I've been that's what I've been doing today is reading through here, making sure that we're going to cover this stuff. So focus mainly on uh, on the best guide. But moving on to page 150, uh, labeling regulations definitely want to know about those certifications. All right, so I don't want you to get too bogged down in all the levels of certifications. Again, we're on page 150 um, because this one talks about animal welfare approved, certified, humane, raised, and handled, uh, certified organic. I would know more about certified organic in that sense um, because that's going to have a big impact on the cheese world. And of course, kosher. I would understand a little bit about what kosher is and how to make kosher cheese. Probably again, maybe one question on each of these on the test. So it's not a great deal, but definitely know about it. Uh, then on page 151, it goes into Melodius uh, certified. I don't recall, I would, I would know page 151, but I don't recall specific questions about that per se. Um, moving on to page 152, uh, one, one thing that's not on here that I would pay attention to though is B corporations, B is in Bravo, B corporations. That is something that uh, if you want to learn more about that, look up Rogue Creamery. That's a prime example of a B Corp in the United States and you will get asked about B Corps. It's just not in this book. B Corps are great. They treat their people, animals, all the processes all really well. Uh, but specifics on page 152, Sustainable business practices. Yeah, you got to know about that. The Food Alliance. Um, I would know what this is. Uh, slow food. You know, the, with the emblem of the snail. You guys have probably all heard of slow food. Get a grasp of what that is. Um, moving on down past that. 
there are labels without certifications. Three of those that I have listed here are grass-fed, raw milk, and farmstead. It's just a, it's good to have a sense to know that not every label actually means something or is actually certified in any way. And you can call grass-fed raw milk or farmstead. There's no legality to it, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see, considerations in curating your product collection. So in that sense, uh, again, on page 152, that can get kind of nebulous as far as how to curate a right cheese set because it can break down into different businesses, whether it be a restaurant, retail, uh, or a class structure. But focus on the facts of cheese. As far as how to build a good board, you can get different opinions, but they will think of different milk types, different ages, uh, different styles of cheese. Think about creating a well-rounded board. The questions won't be uh, specific to say, how do you create a well-rounded cheese board? It's more like they'll, they'll get you, uh, they'll list out cheeses like A, B, C, and D. They'll give you the choices and then which one makes the best rounded cheese board. So it'll be up to you to look at the cheeses and think, is this a range? Is there, is there a theme to it? Are they all French? Are they all Dutch? Or do they all make sense living together, so to speak? But there may be one question on that. So we're gonna move through. Um, shelf life uh, and date marking. Again, that's gonna be more information coming from your guide for uh, cheese makers, your best practices there. But that is something to read over. I didn't find anything glaring in that particular passage, but moving to page 154. Um, so pricing and margins, oh, you will absolutely need to do math. Um, for this, I'm just going to focus on you need to know your, your, your gross margin method, and that's on page 155, and your markup method. So those, uh, these, these give you equations. I'm not going to do math today because I'm going to direct you to the YouTube page for IDF uh, where Zoe Brickley recorded a session with me last year where she goes through and like she just has a much better way of breaking down math problems and making them really understandable. So there is an hour long recording of math that is going to be your, your, your gross margin, your markup, as well as fat and dry matter. Those are your big three for the test. You will get asked at least two, if not three questions on each of those uh, uh, styles of, of uh, formulas. Okay, so again, that's on uh, that's our IDF video. Uh, I'm not trying to blow over it, but it's much better to watch it on that. Uh, but but keep those going. Uh, let's see. And if you continue on to 156, there's more. And there's even another chapter back here with more practice math questions. So we're going to continue to get to that. Um, as far as, yeah, just know the formulas for those. On page 156, uh, gross margin, know the formula. And continuing on to 157, again, it's more of those three formulas that you're going to need to know. The markup method, the gross margin method, uh, and cost. All right. So I'm going to keep rocking and rolling, team. Uh, you know, that my face may even be better than looking at that piece of paper all day. <laughs> so module 806, this goes back to chapter five of uh, uh, best uh, practices for cheesemakers. I think, you know, I keep deferring you back to that because you're going to get asked questions more specific to that packet than this one. All right. So moving on to page 160. Here they're talking about cheese categories and types. Um, chapter five, again, that you're going to get much more detail of exactly how even they judge. But I'll talk about that in one second. What to know in the IDF manual? Foil wrapped, natural rind. You'll definitely need to know that. You'll need to know on page 161, process. Um, they have also here tome, block, wheel. What you'll find in the IDF manual is a little bit more generic. Um, but once you get into, and again, we'll, we'll start that next uh, call, is going through the actual uh, desk guide. Give me a mute if you guys don't mind out there. On page 162, 
It is good to know also cryovac, like because our business does a lot, you know, cheese business does a lot of cryovac, block cheddars. Uh, you'll need to know wax covered, cloth bound, put a star around cloth bound. That's a particularly unique way to wrap cheese to age it. You will get asked at least one to two questions on that. You need to know that it's lard. Um, you'll need to give examples that it can breathe and wrap. Why do people choose uh, a cloth bound? But that's probably your, your star of the show out of all that list. Of course, mold ripened um, and all that good stuff. Everything else is kind of a little too generic. If you go to page 163, you know, they're semi-soft and semi-firm. That's not specific enough for this test. So keep breezing past that. Um, once you get down, now we're going to be talking about milk types on page 163. And on 163, you're going to get milk type, uh, all this. That's going to be referring to chapter two. Chapter two in guide for best practices for cheesemakers. Chapter two, and they get much more detailed on a lot of this information. This just gives you good stuff about cow, sheep, goat. Of course, you need to know the differences and all that. Uh, on page 164, yeah, we got information here about water buffalo, yak, camel. You're not going to get asked a whole lot of questions necessarily about that. You know, if any, if any questions are going to get asked, it's like, yes, you can make cheeses from these different animals, but what they have in common, they're going to be ruminants. To me, that's going to be the tying link between all this. That could be more of a question for you. Um, Human milk, yeah, you can make cheese out of human milk, but that's that's too personal. <laughs> uh, it's not gonna be quite the, quite the best. Uh, but you will get asked a little bit about breeds. And again, breeds are gonna be broken down in best guide for, for cheese makers. And we're gonna get to a couple here, uh, but know the different breeds of cows for sure. Holstein versus Jersey. Um, I would make some, some flashcards about that and any facts you have on them as far as which one would give out the most fat, which one gives out just the most milk. They will, you will get asked about that. All right, moving on to page 165. This, this now we're moving into our protected cheeses. Uh, so our, our PDOs, AOC. Hopefully you guys have already been reading up on that since the last email I sent out had all the great PDO cheeses uh, to look over and get to learn. Uh, and I don't remember a great deal of questions necessarily like what does PDO stand for? You may, you may need to know that. But as far as uh, listing out which one is for each country, I don't think they're gonna try to trick you on that, but you still need to know it. So if you move to page 166, at the bottom of the page of 166, what is behind the PDO, PGI, TSG foodstuff logo? Read that, protected designation of origin, know that. Uh, that's the bottom one. And then move to page 167. And here, if you look into the middle of the page, you'll see country specific designations. And you got those bullet points on page 167. That's really what you need to know. Um, Cause where, you, where it will trick you up more than anything is for them to ask you if a certain cheese is a PDO or a, any kind of protected cheese and it, and it not be at all. Like, I don't think they're gonna go for, put a DO, you know, a Spanish label behind an Italian cheese to trick you up. Don't think like that. It's more along the lines of, is it actually a protected cheese or not? And knowing what that stands for and what it means, right? Okay, so we're blowing through here. Now we're moving on to the next one. So this is gonna be module 807. They're much shorter here at the end. So this is, um, all right, so cheese assessment and evaluation. Everything in this chapter, I would refer back to the ACS lexicon and glossary, the ACS lexicon and glossary. Is this, the, this IDF book I think has a good introduction to it, but the lexicon and glossary, which I would love to share with you, I had open on my computer if it would work, uh, but that's gonna cover defects. It goes deeply into it and it's what the cheese judges use when actually they're judging cheeses for the conference. So the questions are gonna come from there. The call after next will be specifically on that and we'll all go through that as a group as well. But there are some good things to pick out in this chapter in idea. Let's see. Page 170. It's a nice read, but nothing really specific is going to come out of there. Uh, but if you go to 171, page 171, 
general cheese evaluation terminology. I would focus on getting some of that together. Okay. Um, because it really goes into body and texture characteristics, color characteristics, eye formation, and flavor characteristics. So you're not going to be able to sensorily evaluate a cheese specifically, but they will ask more questions about defects. Because that is something, especially we as cheesemongers, anybody along the chain selling cheese, we need to know how to tell if cheese is good or if it's bad. So the defects are going to be very important as far as to learn. And again, that's in the glossary. Um, excellent. So moving to page 172. You get some good stuff here. I would focus on eye development. Because the eye development in cheese, of course, those are the holes that you see in the Swiss cheese. They're desirable in some cheeses. I would know which ones those are, like Emmentaler. Some of those, it's a good sign. They want those in there. But some eye formation is bad in certain cheeses. All right, so I would know which ones those are. Then let's see. Continue on to page 173. This, again, I find you're going to get much more information out of that uh, uh, out of the glossary uh, on, on the uh, website. But the ripening process, if you look at the ripening process on 173, you'll get some good facts out of that. And then of course, anytime you see defects, definitely study the defects because defects on a bloomy rind soft ripen are gonna be different than the defects of an Alpine style uh, Appenzeller per se. And then we're continuing on because again, let's see, page 174. All of them are good to know, but we're going to get more specific in the other book. Acid development on the bottom of page 174. That's a good thing to know. Because that goes through all the way through the top of 175. All righty. And we're going through, I don't want you to study all this too hard because again, I'd rather you study the glossary much more. Um, moving on to page 176. Yeah, these get specifically into Hispanic cheeses, but I wouldn't delve too deep into that. It's good for you to know as a cheese expert, but not so big on the test. I'm moving on to page 177. And again, you'll see that a lot of this is going to be kind of generic information as far as you know, what are, what are some uh, ways that, that bloomy rind cheeses are bad, so to say, if you move down to 177, looking for consistency and white fluff, no dark areas, no excessive moisture. Uh, they could give you questions such as that, where they have, you know, the ABCD is listed out of certain defects or certain things that are bad, and you would have to pick the one that would most appropriately go with the cheese they ask about. All righty, but now we're going to get to some real information on page 178. 178. We're going to have uh, now the different types of spoilage. This is interesting, and these are questions that are going to come up on your test um, as far as microbial spoilage versus fungal spoilage, spoilage due to yeasts, bacterial spoilage. So bacterial spoilage is the most important because that bacteria spoilage can also is what's gonna to lead to a lot of illnesses. And anything again, the food safety aspect of this test guys, know your food safety and which, which organisms get you sick. You're gonna get asked about those. Uh, but the big thing to remember here is psychiotrophic bacteria. It's right under, it's a second paragraph of bacteria spoilage on page 178. That's something to absolutely know about. Then if you move to page 179, Combination of milk. That's going to be a big one to know. So that's a good paragraph all the way through um, down to interpreting eyes, holes, fissures, and cracks in the paste of cheese. Now that is important information. And that leaving even down on page 179 in the middle of the page, you've got that nice colored box in there. Uh, propionic uh, fermentation. Absolutely highlight that. Big thing to know, because here and after that, that gets into your eye formation. Eye formation is important. All righty, moving to page 180. 
there's a lot of information here, touching and interpreting. You're not going to ask about that. Uh, you're going to get asked more about, though, gas holes on page 180. As, so know about those as well as the clostrotum uh, spores in your, the, that cause the late blowing in the box at the bottom of 180. That'll probably be asked of you. Late blowing, that is absolutely a term that you need to know. It sounds crazy, but it just means that uh, it started, the cheese has started to split late after the cheese is formed, creating a big fissure. You see that more often than not in alpine style cheeses of cows that have been eating fermented hay. Fermented hay leads to late blowing. All right, now to page 181, um, so taste. Taste, you'll need to pick out some things. You're not gonna get asked so much about how you do taste or too much stuff about your tongue, but it is good for you guys as cheese experts to know over that. But you will get asked about aroma. I feel like aroma is gonna be a big thing. So on page 181, aroma. We're gonna ask a couple of things in that for sure. And then on page 182. All right, 182, if you go down, you'll, you'll read isolating flavors caused by defects. Again, I threw out that defects will be asked a lot. So focus on isolating flavors, defects, all below, you're gonna get different things that are defects. So know about that. Absorption of flavors by packaged milk can occur in the plant. That's a great thing to know. Chlorine or other sanitizers can and sometimes do get into the cheese and milk and cause significant off flavors. That, I remember that being asked. And then, then getting into uh, other specific cheese defects, all of these terms. I would definitely know, so on, we're on page 182, bitterness, fruity, stale. Then moving to page 183, you'll see rancid, oxidized, soapy, unbalanced unclean, all of those. I would definitely read up on that. And then, of course, uh, calcium lactate crystals. You got to know about that and tyrosine crystals. Hopefully you guys like that should have been studied a little bit in the past. Hopefully you already have a grasp on those guys, but you'll see how many times we've covered them. <laughs> that goes to show you'll probably get asked about them. All right. Oh man, see that covered that already. We're about through with this book. Excellent. So we're moving on now to module 808, cheese service. Now cheese service, I find, I found that you could compare that to chapter seven. Chapter seven of the best uh, guide for cheese makers, best practice guide for cheese makers. Chapter seven. All right, but this does have a lot of great information popping into this IDF book. So page 186. All right, I made a note here and we're gonna come against it, but it also we're gonna talk about a three part sink. But a question you need to be able to answer is how to properly clean and sanitize a cutting board. There are steps that are gonna be in the best guide for the best practices for cheese makers. It's coming out of that book in chapter seven, but there's a specific order of how to, how to properly wash a cheese bo uh, cutting board I would know that. All righty, then moving through here though, um, cleaning agents. So on page 186 again, cleaning agents are divided into four categories. I would know those four categories as far as a detergent, a solvent, acid, or an abrasive cleaner. All right, then sanitizing. Sanitizing is a huge deal. When talking about uh, uh, cleaning, sanitizing is big um, and there's different types of sanitizing that you can use. We're gonna have, uh, again, we're at the bottom of page 186. So heat, chemicals, to so know those, chemical sanitizers. So we're moving to page 187. And let's see, high temperature machines. So reading through this, the main thing to know is gonna be at the bottom, which here we have 
cleaning and sanitizing in a three compartment sink. So page 187, that's your highlight. Put a bunch of stars around there, cleaning and sanitizing in a three compartment sink. Uh, and then of course, following that cleaning in place equipment. And notice that there is a difference. Okay. So here we go on page 188. We're moving on in our book. So we've got lactose intolerance. Absolutely. Anything, as far as any of these studying materials you see, you read lactose intolerance, read over all that material. You're going to get asked at least three questions about that because it is a major deal in our industry. Um, so that's page 188. Moving on, what causes lactose intolerance? That's a good read. How is lactose intolerance diagnosed? Absolutely know that. How is it treated? And what is it? What uh, does this mean? Lactose intolerant people can't ever have cheese ever. You need to know that they can have cheese, right? We know they can have cheese. On page 189, um, here, this is a guide. Uh, like the, ver the first bullet point, you'll see your cheeses with low lactose. I don't recall questions asked about specific percentages of lactose, but knowing what cheeses may be better, what style of cheeses may be better as far as like, you know, uh, you look here, just look through the range and you'll see the lactose that's in there. So know what could be a little bit less. But it's, I would say lactose goes more into the health effect. Uh, they're going to ask questions more about that. Listeriosis and pregnancy on page 189. Teas and pregnancy. Um, they're going to say, like, you know, if the, they may avoid this question because it can be general, because I've known uh, lots of ladies that have eaten raw cheese. But if they ask a question about it, it would be something along the lines of what's in the bullet points. Um, in this uh, paragraph. So in general, you can protect yourself from listeriosis uh, by the following these guidelines. And it's got the three bullet points. Avoid eating cheese made of unpasteurized milk, soft cheeses made with pasteurized milk, and avoid raw milk. Those three things could be more of a question than anything else. All right, now pairings. Okay. I do recall a couple of questions years ago about pairings on the test. Now pairings, a lot of times can be opinions, right? And that's one thing that, that, that can be a little bit hard. So when reading through this section, and I do suggest on page 189, where it starts about pairings and it goes all the way through 190, page 190, definitely read that. But when focusing on studying about pairings, think about traditional pairings, like tried and true tradition, like Stilton and Port. You know, if they're to ask specific questions about that, because, you know, we all have our different taste buds or champagne and brie. It may be because of, you know, you got to you got to understand if there is a pairing with a beer or wine. It's more about where is it from and what cheese is also from there. So you got to think a little bit along those lines. Um, that's why I like champagne and brie. Uh, besides that, little helpful hints as Creamy cheeses that get fat all over your palate, bubbles and effervescence help get that off. Um, then other things they can ask about it, uh, more like seasonal pairings. And they could question, they could phrase a question to be a great fall cheddar, uh, Cabot cloth bound uh, cheddar would pair nicely with the seasonal uh, fruit. And they could list an apple. It probably won't be. It'll probably be a betterly phrase, a better phrase question than that. But it's more along the lines of knowing seasonality of fruits and vegetables too, uh, or also what's made with something. So if we know that Rogue uh, River Blue may have been soaked in like a homemade pear brandy, then we would say that probably is going to pair well with pears, if that makes sense. So if there's been something used to wash a cheese, then think that item can be paired with it as well. Hope I didn't get too convoluted in that, in all that. Um, but if you read the pairing pairings considerations on page 189, what grows together goes together. That's a very common phrase, and that's what I was trying to say. And that's where you get the sense of terroir. You know, so if you know it comes from a certain region in Italy or France, they're going to go together, or you're going to add that seasonality to it. Um, let's see. 
So moving on to page 190. You're going to get, I would read through that. Um, actually, too, to know that sweet wines go with blue cheese. I would make a note of that. Sweet wines and blue cheese. That seems to, that seems to stick out of my head on the test. But on page 190, you're looking at fat, salt, acidity. So there's other aspects that go into pairing as well. But don't get too bogged down into it, especially if it leads into something that's more of an opinion. Uh, I would know some, the cheese longra. Let me see if I can spell that. So L-A-N-G-R-E. Longra has a little dimple in it. And in that dimple, something is poured. Look that up. Uh, but that's what I mean by pairings. There's going to be certain things that are traditional, whether you're going to pour champagne into that longra or a specific wine. Uh, that's where they're going to get asked about pairings. All right. Here, now, moving along in the IDF book on page 190, it's talking about wine textures. Uh, you're not going to get asked about wine too much. This is a cheese-focused, uh, a dairy-focused test. Uh, the, only, the only time you'll be uh, talking about any kind of alcoholic beverages is if it's traditionally paired with something. So you don't really need to study too much on how to taste wine, how to taste beer, all that good stuff. Uh, but I would move to page 192. And I would look into, at least know what jam, like here you'll see in the middle of the page, a chutney, jam, jelly, preserve, marmalade. You're not gonna get asked questions specifically about what they are, but if you know the true definition of them, they may mention a preserve and they may, may mention preserve in a question, but anticipate the fact that you know what exactly what a preserve is to say if it goes with a cheese. So it's just good to know what, what the differences of those are. Page 193, I like the seasonality. Anytime you see something about seasonality, that pick up on that. Like if seasonality, let your brain say, oh, I need to read that and focus on here. So here you're gonna see spring, summer, autumn, uh, winter, uh, but seasonal peaks differ for many cheeses based on geography breeder style. But here are some general guidelines for cheeses produced in the Northern Hemisphere. So this will, this will get you like, again, they're not going to say which cheeses are made in the spring, but a pairing item may be ricotta, but you got to think of what's fresh in the spring. Hope I'm making that clear, but you're only going to get probably two to three questions about pairing. So don't bog yourself too, too far with that. Uh, then moving on down page 193, this is great to know not necessarily tested material. Uh, moving to, to 194. Let's see. Again, this is great about more pairings, dessert wines. Uh, the little box is kind of cool because it's, it's all subjective. Um, but subjective but broad rules apply and classic pairings exist. Port with Stilton, Salterns with Rogue Four. I would write those down. Those are going to be good ones. Um, what grows together goes together. Okay, that's just, just going back over that. Um, let's see here. The rest of this, this is food kind of like, you don't need to know so much about the rest of that. Even moving on to page 195. Oh, good stuff, but it's more about beer. It's not a beer quiz. Uh, moving on to page 196. All right, harmonizing a cheese selection. Now this is, all right. You could get asked questions as far as, again, how to pick a cheese bowl, or, you know, you're gonna get asked questions as far as imagining you're opening a cheese shop and you want to create a cheese set. How do you do that? Uh, some of that is going to go into, and that's gonna come out of your best guide for cheese, cheese makers as well, uh, which we're gonna cover. Uh, but know about how to do that because there's going to be uh, market research that is done. So don't just limit your, when you, if you get asked about how to curate a cheese set, a cheese set for a shop. Yeah. There's going to be covering milk types, uh, cheeses from different country, top sellers, but you also have to look at the demand from the customers and that's doing market research. And that's a, that's more of a fact that could be asked about necessarily than, than just one of these random like, What's your favorite cheese set? Because that, that can all be subjective. But definitely read over that because it would give you a good bit of sense 
as far as how to how to approach that. Uh, and now the, then this also talks about selling cheese. So even from a monger aspect uh, or from a waiter aspect, don't get bogged down on anything that's too subjective, but again, the facts. How is the best way to convey the information to your customer uh, or what information is most, uh, most needed from, you know, to your customer? Always think of milk type, origin. Uh, in milk type, of course, you're going to want to know if you know not only what animal, but is it raw or pasteurized? That's important for the customer to know. Uh, where it's from, the story. Those are those are the three aspects. I think if you're really focusing on proactive sales from a cheesemonger, those are three areas to really hit up. The rest of it's going to be like you can throw in extra, you can throw in pizzazz, but they're not going to ask you questions about pizzazz. You're going to get quest, you're going to get quizzed on origin milk type, you know, uh, background story of it. Everybody, you probably want to know, speaking of, I'll interject some information here, uh, the story of Humboldt Fog uh, by the maker Mary Keene. If you've had any previous classes with me, you know, I go into the fact that she shares that she had a dream after seeing more BA being made. She had a dream of, of how uh, a line of vegetable ash would stand out in a stark white goat cheese, but that vegetable ash is meant to mimic the fog rising into the bay. Now, how are you going to know about that besides selling cheese? You're going to have to read up on some of these great American classics in the same way that, uh, that you know, there, there are some that, are, that was on the list that I emailed out uh, a little while back, but the big dogs, and I hate to call it that, they're probably a better way to say that term, but your, your award-winning cheeses, the staple, New American, or the New American staples. So Humboldt Fog, Pleasant Ridge Reserve, Rogue River Creamery, uh, Rogue River Blue. Those, you know, the stories behind those big cheeses because they're gonna get thrown in there as well. And that's gonna be asking you from the aspect of how educated of a cheesemonger are you, basically. So I hope that made sense. Um, you know, even like who influenced it? Like what style? Okay, here's, a, so many good things coming today. We don't need no stinking Zoom share. Uh, but what cheese, you may want to know what cheese uh, influenced uh, the making of Pleasant Ridge Reserve. What was the inspiration of Pleasant Ridge Reserve? You may want to look that up. Uh, also from, uh, uh, there's a cheese called Grayson. A cheese called Grayson. I would look that cheese up. You know what cheese inspired that being made? That's from Meadow Creek, Meadow Creek Dairy. But they're, they're giving you, ooh, I'm giving you guys some good hints. I can't give you the answers, but I'm giving you guys, hopefully you're making some notes out of this. Because um, that's going to go back, when anything, when it's talking about selling cheese, they're, they're going to ask for facts like that, basically. All right. Good information going there. So now back to my IDF book. That was a little sidebar for you. Uh, but back on page 197, into, let's hit a mute, everybody. All right. Here we go. I think I got everybody muted. Okay. 197. Again, this is talking about cart service, table service. There's a lot of opinion in that. I would be, I, I wouldn't study too much on that. Maybe read the page. Um, but I would worry about the only thing I would really focus on in any of these different service styles are. What is the downside of it? How could somebody get sick off of a table service? So anything like, so potential issues of liability on page 197, that's a more, more suited question for this industry. All right, 198, we're moving along here. I've got this, I made a little line to read all this, um, but let's see, because make the cheese alive with anecdotes, information about the cheese maker, et cetera. So here, uh, oh, Vela Dry Jack. Make a note to know that cheese as well. Vela Dry Jack. That's, uh, that's on this page, on page 198. But here again, it's kind of more like opinion of how, how to become a great salesperson. Uh, but the story, that is a fact, is that that is the expectation of a cheesemonger. I'm going to keep saying it. The name, milk type, origin, story. Good things to know. Um, but here I've got highlighted on page 198, staff knowledge. 
So how do you let your customers know about the fine cheese selection you offer in the first step to a successful program? The expertise and enthusiasm you install in your staff will communicate that excitement to your customers. Knowledge. This is, so anytime you see as far as in, 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 in selling or you know, thinking about questions for this test, the whole point of this test is for people to get more knowledge about cheese to sell more cheese. So you're more than likely gonna get asked questions about that if it's specific, how to sell and how to gain that knowledge. So I've got that highlighted. You know, and these are suggestions as far as how to, how to create a great staff. And I think that's some good information there, but staff knowledge. Plating cheese. Um, you know, they, they could ask questions as far as plating. You know, I, I would have it in your head to leave cheese out for at least 30 to 45 minutes before you eat it. Like even those little facts, which you probably already have drilled in your head. If you've been in cheese this long, you probably already know that. But those are things that can come out in questions too. Um, you know, how to, how to best serve it, going from mild to wild. They could have a question as to, to say, you know, you're sampling out rope for and fromage d'affumois. Which cheese would you serve first and why? That, that was oversimplifying it, but hopefully you get the gist of that. Moving on, so plating cheeses, training how to cut, portioning. So train staff to cut and plate. I would highlight that area, but we're gonna to get to some more facts on the next page or so. The rest of this is just good to know, but I don't see anything. So I'm on page 199 right now. I would read over that. This is good to know as far as serving cheese, but like, you know, down at the bottom, it's got choose three to five cheeses for a cheese tasting. Strong flavors, meaning like that's, that's general. There may be one question about something like that, but it's also good to know. Now let's move to page uh, 200. We're moving right along, my friends. There's a graph there, but you know, it's hard. Like there's a lot of, uh, it's hard to ask a fact about what, how, what would you suggest? How much poundage of cheese do you suggest to a customer? because there's so many questions that go before that, like, are they hungry? Are they Nathan sized people at this party that are gonna eat? You're gonna need a little bit more. So when thinking about that, don't bog your head down into learning those kind of stats, if that makes sense, because there's too many more questions that go to it. Where they could ask a question though is, what are some great questions to ask your customers when suggesting a cheese board? And it could be, you know, are they, you know, what time of day, is this a dinner service? Uh, are they cheese enthusiasts? Are they new to cheese? So they could, you know, they could give you primer questions, basically. Uh, but I made a note here at the bottom. <laughs> I'm being too nice to you guys. What is a skeleton knife? Write that down. What is a skeleton knife? A skeleton is in your bones. Um, that one come up. Now, remember that one hitting me out of the blue, but that's a good question to do you know the answer to? And what cheese would you cut with a skeleton knife? All right. Now moving to page 201. Um, proper cleaning and sanitizing. Like the, the wood boards, what boards to serve on. That's, don't worry about that. That's personal choice. But what is not personal choice, how to clean and sanitize. Cleaning and sanitizing is not a personal choice. It is a must. So anytime you see that pop up in your book, highlight it, read it, and know it. The rest of them are just, they, they may look pretty. Now moving to page 202. Um, yeah, you got different cutting board colors here. I don't remember anything specific about that. Luckily, if they ask you what color a dairy board should be, it's white. Like milk, easy to remember. <laughs> um, but receiving cheese... I highlight that. So on page 202, receiving the cheese. You're going to need to know that. That is, an, that is an extremely important part of our business because, because distributors receive it from producers. Retailers receive it from distributors and customers receive it from our retailers. So there's a, it goes down the chain of command and at each one of those, something can happen to affect that cheese. So receiving is a huge deal. Know it. Uh, Good work, sir. Good work, station sanitation. That's on 202 as well. Again, anytime about sanitation, that is a 
utmost important to all of us. Let's see, then we're continuing on 203, Serve Safe Food Handler Program. It's good to know that it exists, but I don't, but you know, if you have a serve safe, you'll know more about food safety, which is great, but there's not gonna be a question, I don't think, to talk specifically about serve safe. They want to, they're gonna ask more about HACCP and critical control points. Uh, cutting and wrapping cheese, that one I highlighted, good to know. How to cut cheese, I would say you're not gonna get asked specifically about that, but the thing to focus on with any way of cutting cheese is there should be one term, even rind distribution. So if there's anything that pops up on the test about how to cut cheese or different ways to cut cheese, the reason we do certain cheeses in certain ways is even rind distribution. Then on page 204, you got a list here of your cheese tools. So this, these are to know, like these you need to know inside and out. Uh, if you're not a cheesemonger, get to know them. If you're a cheesemonger that doesn't know all these tools, get to know them. I know a lot of you that are trained really focus just on parm tools. That's my sign language for parm tools. Uh, and the, the wire box cutter. There's more than that. You'll need to know Roquefort bow. Wink. Roquefort bow. Write that down. Know it, love it, live it. Uh, and that you're going to use that to cut uh, softer cheeses, such as blue cheeses. That's why it's called Roquefort. Uh, the rest of them you should know, paring knife, the double-handled cheese knife. A lot of you may not be familiar with a double-handled wire. So if you're not familiar with that, read over that one, because of course that's a good one as far as cutting those giant Alpine cheeses. That's what I used to use as far as with those, you know, huge Willa Gruyere and Conte. Um, rest of it you should know. You got your, uh, your grana tools and your platform cutter, but skeleton knife. I'm going to say that one more time. Skeleton knife. Know what that is as well. All right. Regulations. We're moving on now. Um, this is module 809, but you will find all this information also doubled up in chapter eight. Chapter eight of uh, best practices for cheesemakers. Uh, and I find, again, I keep pointing that out because it's going to get a lot more detailed in that. That's what you really want to go for uh, as far as some of this information. All right, so page 206, well, I got you for a few more minutes. And again, uh, I'm gonna keep going until I finish up with the book. If you need to leave right on time, just exit. All this will be put up on the IDF website. So I'm just gonna keep going. If you can hang with me, hang with me. Uh, but on page 206, 206 of your IDF book, Code of Federal Regulations. This is gonna get, you're gonna get bogged down here a little bit, but you need to know the the, the food safety, especially the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. But the kicker here is when you're making your notes, know what is regulated by the FDA versus the Department of Agriculture. That's a little tip as far as when I've studied with people uh, or you know, working with uh, we're working with studiers, studiers over the years. That's what that's what bogs people down, and they could they could trick you with that. They may throw out regulation that's from the FDA, but give credit uh, to the Department of Agriculture and it'd be wrong. So make sure you keep those distinctions. Um, then continuing down 206, good manufacturing practices and risk man management. Know it. I would take time studying this. You're gonna get asked several questions about food regulations. Uh, the food code, but down on 206. Um, Know that, uh, 207, page 207, the 60 day rule. You're gonna get, know the, know the top line of the 60 day rule here. It's almost like you're gonna have a whole page worth of information on the 60 day rule for raw milk. Really, you just need to know that there's a 60 day rule <laughs> for raw milk cheeses. Uh, keep that in mind and don't back down too much, but know what the government thinks. Why is 60 days okay? And that's about it. Uh, all righty, then moving to page 208, historical uh, perspective. That's good stuff to know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so deep into it. You know, it's good to read over, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hurt my brain like memorizing all those facts. I would move over to page 209 though, on page 209, and I'd hit my definitions, right? 
So definitions and glossary. Um, and let's see. And it gets into a lot of 60 day rule too. Don't bog down so much into that. But I would turn to page 210 and tariff system license. And see, that's by the Department of Agriculture. Know who does that? Uh, but everything here, everything listed on page 210 into 211 is important. A license, the definition of a license. USDA uses licensing to administer uh, TRQ. So the tariff rate quote, quota. Uh, on page 211, products needing import licenses. You need to know that. You'll probably get asked, a question on each of these, uh, I would say, uh, the different kinds of licenses, and yes, even historical, non-historical, and designated. They will pop those in there for you. That's gonna be on the test. And then on page 212, thanks for hanging with me. Uh, straight bill of lading, know it. This one, I've got the whole page, everything on 212. You need to know what's on there. This is a, uh, an example here on the page for you, uh, if you got it, but you need to know what it is, who it comes from and who it goes to. But that's a big one to know. Um, then on page 213, continuing on free uh, onboard freight. But I do wanna again point out, all this gets more specific in chapter eight of the best guide for cheesemakers. Um, but we're going to get into here on page 213. This, this, this was a lot for me to study, but the HACCP. HACCP, Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points. There are several, I'm going to look into the camera, several questions about HACCP and crit, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, critical control points. Uh, page 214 continues on with it. Uh, and that gets into chapter nine. Actually, I've made more notes. So it goes into chapter nine of your best practice guide. But here you're gonna cover on page 214, your seven basic uh, HACCP principles. Absolutely need to know those. Absolutely need to know the seven principles. Uh, continuing on to 215. Again, all this is important to know, but your seven principles, should, you should highlight that, get that stuck out there. Um, uh, know what a, a hazard analysis is on page 215. Critical control limits. That is just definitely something good to know all that. Page 216. That just follows everything else up. Um, and page 217. Here on the page 217, I would focus more on the frequency of verification. 217, that's middle of the page. Uh, verification, receiving logs, cooling logs. I could definitely see you getting asked one question about receiving logs, one question about cooling logs, as well as hand washing. So know the different log types. All righty, page 218. Uh, in the middle of the page on page 218, there are at least five types of records that may be maintained to support your food safety management system. And that's in bullet points, so know those. Then page 219, you need to know uh, in the middle of the page, it says, is it a review or audit of the plan? So you need to know what a review and what an audit means. So this is when you're, this is trying to go back to if you have uh, in chapter nine of best practice guides go into this or so recall. So review and audit that lead to a recall. Write the word recall down, circle it, highlight it, star it. But that is you are going to get asked a few questions about recalls because that is a big deal in our industry. What causes a recall? Who authorizes a recall? And what are the steps of a recall? Because in this industry, especially, you know, if you're going to pass around food that's got salmonella, you need to, it also has to go back. There's another word, 
traceability. All of that uh, is going to go in. You're going to ask about that for sure. Because in this industry, again, we want to make sure that we are keeping people safe. Uh, and these are the steps that if you were to own a business or to run a distri uh, distribution center or even to be a producer, especially, these are things that you're going to have to know. So it's like less knowledge for the cheesemonger, but more for going back to the producer and distribution level, but still very important for you to know. All right, and we're going to continue on. We're almost done, guys. I know we're just a minute or two over, uh, but those are, I'm, I'm continuing to talk about all that. Uh, and here, oh my God, page 220, exactly what I just said. Recalls. That is something so, um, def definitely know all of that. And again, if you're going to go into your best practice guide for cheesemakers, I'm going to give you even more information. All righty. So know all about, all about that. Page 220. 221. Know the different classes. That's got recall classifications on here. Class one, class two, class three. And then it leads into at the bottom of 221, traceability systems. Get into that. Whew. All right. So the, the rest of this guide that was sent out um, is the module 810, the supplemental materials. More math for you. More math. So what you need to do is continue practicing your math, uh, but memorize uh, your uh, formulas. I'm trying to think of the word formula. Memorize the formulas and again, refer back, refer back to the IDF video of myself and Zoe. And she, Zoe Brickley does a much better job talking about math and you can actually work on problems as you go through the, 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 uh, the training. But you'll definitely need to know that. Uh, then after that, you got your glossary. That's straightforward. That's everything you need to know there. The glossary, I would, uh, if I were you, I would turn all of these words into flashcards to know all these, the, the glossary information. And that is the level 800 book. Next month, as soon as we get closer, I'm going to go through this best practice guide for cheesemakers that I kept referring to today. And we're going to dive deep into this. And I'm going to continue with the same kind of information, narrowing down this stuff for you so you don't have to study such a broad range. Perfect. I hope that was helpful. And again, I'm so sorry for the share feature on my computer. I will figure it out for next class. Uh, until then, I will be sending out an email. Uh, I'm going to be sending you a quiz pretty soon. I've got a 150 question quiz. So now we're at the time of year where I think you've had time to study. So we're going to gauge what you need to know and where you need to and what you need to study more. It's more for you to help you. Uh, so I'll get that sent out as soon as possible. It's not going to be on the computer. I apologize. It's still going to be uh, basically a Word document where I'll send you the answer separately. Uh, but it's something that you can print off and answer uh, at your leisure. But it'll help you out. Until then, uh, please shoot me any questions or comments. Uh, and if, I, if you have sent me something recently, forgive me. I've been away for just a little bit, but I'm starting to get back to everybody right now. All righty. Let's see. I got a chat. All righty. If anybody needs anything, I'm going to put an Aldridge. At gfifoods.com. Shoot me questions and I'll be happy to answer. All righty. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, man.